700 trillion of financial assets, 1.3 trillion of Bitcoin. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't want to sound crazy or, you know, hyperbolic, but I mean, I think we might all be really, really surprised by how much this thing can go up and does go up. Yeah, I saw Samson Mao in Atlanta. So, I mean, he's just like willing to spend his kids on the fact that we're going to a million bucks. Jesus, if we go to a million bucks, that's going to be life altering and, and, and frankly, a shock to the existing legacy finance guys. The world doesn't understand just how solid the hands are that hold the I mean, it's not like it goes to 75. Oh yeah, there's gonna be a ton of supply. No, everyone who's in this is like, we're playing for a million. I mean, I think when we get to a million a coin, you're gonna see if we could touch upon this whole multiplier thing. Have you noticed how, you know what I'm talking about? You know, like the roughly $8 billion has gone into the ETFs and the market cap of Bitcoin as a result of, since that started, the market cap of Bitcoin has gone up by 300. That's a 37 multiplier and the reason that occurs Mr. Larry Lepard, thank you so much, brother, for coming on today. Uh, I just I appreciate you more than more than you know, and uh, we have a special uh, relationship, which I really appreciate. Very uh, kind. Ever, ever since we suffered through that CrossFit workout, <laughs> uh, that I'm you're, still sore from it. You're you're a, you're a friggin' beast. I mean, that's I, mean, oh, wow. I don't think most people know that you played for the USA hockey team. You're one hell of an athlete, wow. but yeah, anyway, I'm also. Um, yeah, no, you're you're a good friend, and I'm I'm happy to be on your pod anytime you like. So, um, Man, well, I, I, if I'm in your shape. I'm in your shape, Larry, in 30 years, then I'm doing something right. So well, let's, let's just do that. I'm not, I'm not where yeah. you are, but that's, you know, Thanks. I've noticed as you get old, it gets harder. <laughs> My performance has gone, gone downhill, but I'm very consistent. I, I try and show up every day. And that really counts quick, a lot. Yes, really, really quick before we jump into the ETF yeah. stuff and the 6102 and what we were talking about off stage, what's the book that you always recommend to everybody that changed your life? Just in the oh, last yeah, this, this book changed my life. It's called Younger Next Year. And it's um, Crowley and somebody else. There are two authors, but one of them is one of them's last name is Crowley. You Google it, you find it. Yeah. So yes. this, I think the federal government, or you know, not the government should do anything, but everyone should buy this book when they turn fifty, because what it basically does is it explains to you the aging process and how one can delay the aging process by working very hard at their fitness level. And uh, you know, there are seventy or eighty year olds who have the fitness level of forty year old. And there are 60 year olds who are, have the fitness level of a 90 year old because they let themselves go. And, and this yeah. book does a really nice job of kind of laying out how you should change your mindset as you age. I mean, 20s, 30s, 40s, I mean, you, you know, you got a lot of free time you're, and you're, you're naturally in pretty good shape. I mean, you're, you know, your, your body doesn't start. But at 50, I noticed things really start to go in the wrong direction. <laughs> and so you got to. You got to work out if you want to maintain, you know, the health that, that, yeah. that, you, that, you know, would be worth having when you're older so that you can play with your grandkids and stuff. So, yeah, but I thank you for sharing that because I think that's, yeah. like you said, it's incredibly it's important. It's, I, I've sent it out to a ton of friends. I highly recommend it. Older yes. people should read it. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things, one of the first things we conversed about, obviously working out together is what, how, kind of how we met. And then I'll never yeah. forget you saying that and just, you know, how important that is. So, yeah. um, so I appreciate that. Anyway, going into this, the ETF obviously is the big thing, everything that's going on here. I have, let's, let's take it out further though, from even sure. modern day, we can touch on that. But the, to me, it's inevitable, the 6102, what, you know, like everyone's right. like, is government going to buy Bitcoin? Well, they have it. It's right there in front of us. And, and a lot of people, you know, so. Although I think they still hold some that they haven't sold off from some of the true. places where they confiscate. I don't know the exact numbers as I recall, it's 100,000 plus. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, um, you know, there's, what's government? There are a lot of buckets in government. And I was just told by my partner last night that he met Jason Lowry at a meetup um, in Boston last year. And Lowry told him kind of on the QT, but I think I can say it here that, that, you know, the CIA and the Pentagon actually realize how important it is. And so if they have anything to do with it, you know, they would want to own some um, and they get the strategic importance of it, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, but setting that aside in the 6102 risk, let's discuss that. I mean, so, you know, as Saylor says, and I think he's right, you know, the approval of the ETFs was an enormous thing because it, it, for, for traditional financial people, for traditional fund managers, it removed what in their mind, I think, in many cases was the largest risk associated with Bitcoin, which is to say the government hates it. Yeah, that's great. It's all cool. But the government hates it. They're going to shut this thing down. And we can't, you know, how can I buy something? I know the government's going to shut down. Well, Guess what? They didn't. And I have to say, honestly, I was very pleasantly surprised. I thought the ETFs were going to get delayed, not approved, et cetera. And I think what it maybe shows you is the power of a BlackRock and, you know, all their money and all their lobbying. I mean, they realized mm -hmm. they could make money on it and they pushed it through somehow. So here we are. We've got them. That's great. And, and that, that, that provides some regulatory clarity 
to a lot of fund managers, to a lot of people are kind of like, well, look, if the government hated it, why do they let the ETFs get created? Um, and, and so to me, it's, that's a real big, big change. And of course, we've seen the response and the price and the flows. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and so I, I think in the short run, um, there's really, and, and, and the other thing is keep in mind that what it does is it allows them to also have it within their box or within their system. Um, and so there may have been, you know, they may have been game theorying it and thinking, okay, you know, all these people are buying it and self custodying it, which Elizabeth Warren hates. And we can't see it when it's on somebody's treasure. We don't know who the hell has what. I mean, we can KYC it and see where it came from. But, you know, as, as you know, it's kind of hard, hard to keep track. Right. Um, and if we approve the ETF, at least we'll be able to see it and tax it, you know, so better inside the fence than outside the fence. And so, so they, you know, if, if you're being real conspiratorial, they, they think, well, let's get all these guys inside the fence. So at least we can see them. Um, but, you know, I, I, I certainly don't think they're going to flip flop anytime soon and, and, you know, go negative on Bitcoin. I think Elizabeth Warren, you know, she wants to prevent all self custody. I don't think she'll succeed at that. She might succeed, though, at causing all of us to have to report what we own. As you'll recall, we had to check a box on our taxes that said we have crypto, we've been dealing in crypto. Yeah. And it strikes me that this is very similar to when they made us report our Swiss bank accounts. That you know they they don't want people dodging taxes, so if you own it, they want you to report it. So I could actually see them doing some law like that. But um, so let's talk longer term though about sixty one hundred two. Um, you know I don't think today you know I mean it's going up, it's working, it's a it, you know it's a good investment, etc. But it's not it doesn't appear to most of them today to be an existential threat. I mean you and I both know it is an existential threat, and that eventually it's going to eat the entire fiat world. And we're going to be denominating our, our lives in sats. Okay, we know that, but they don't know that yet. <laughs> but they're going to learn that as they, as, as they watch the prices go up. And um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, there are guys like Joe Carlosari, who's you know active on Bitcoin Twitter, who who you know trusts the government, I think, and believes that they would never do a sixty one hundred two. That that's something odd and passive, to which I just say absolute and utter bullshit. I mean, you know, they changed the short selling rules in two thousand eight. They changed the rules in March of. 2023 for Silicon Valley. I mean, they change the rules whenever it suits their purposes and yes. they need to keep their system going and their system broken. And when it becomes very, very clear that Bitcoin is eating their system and helping to cause their system to fail, um, I think entirely they will, you know, either 6102 or 90% tax it or, you know, whatever whatever it is they do to it, you know, it'll be the Save American Currency Act. And they'll, you know, they'll figure out a way to, to determine that we're all evil people who are ruining their currency. Um, so, but I think that's a ways out because that's not obvious today. I mean, it's, you know, it'll become more obvious over time. Um, how, you know, what are the odds on that? How do I rate that? I don't know. I really don't. It's probably 50-50. I mean, it's, you know, but, but I do know that those who are on the inside and who control the system, they just have an enormous vested interest in not having us succeed because, you know, it, it, it you know, if, if we succeed, all fiat wealth goes to zero. And so, you know, they, and they can't really stop us. I mean, and they can't really stop the system. It's too distributed, et cetera. So, you know, they've got a problem on their hands. Now, the other tool I think they'll use to mess us up and they use this in gold a bit too, is they will, um, I mean, What's the only thing that's left wrong with Bitcoin? And I don't think it's something that's really wrong, but I, I think to an outsider or to a newbie or to a traditional finance person, it's wrong. We want to thank our sponsor. This show is presented by Bitcoin Trading Cards, an orange pill in a pack, making talking about things that normally make you want to cry fun and easy. The scarcest and most educational cards to ever exist, available now. To try and scare people away from it. I guess that's the, the point I'm making, but... On the 6102, I think it's a very low probability in the next year or two because I think they've approved it and they're not going to, you know, they, wouldn't, they couldn't flip on a dime like that. I think it becomes a higher probability when things are really falling apart. And, and you know, this is, the, this is the leading canary in the coal mine, right? I mean, gold, they've managed to suppress that. So if this thing is going to the moon, you know, that, that's going to be scary for fiat people and they you know when, when people are scared back into a corner they do you know they do crazy stuff so we'll have to see and and that's why i mean i would argue i don't disagree you know i don't argue against people who don't want to take the time to self cut well i think everybody should self-custody okay that's you know point one mm -hmm. but you know i look at 
you know, 80 year olds who don't necessarily understand the technology, don't want to take the time to learn the technology, but they want to be exposed. Well, fine. If they want to buy the ETF, that's fine. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think the risk of a 6102 in the next year or two is that high. Um, I think over time, everyone should start into the journey of getting into Bitcoin. And then once you begin to recognize these risks, you pretty quickly get to where I am, which is that you got to self custody it. <laughs> you don't want somebody else to hold it. Because if it's, you know, the, as we all say, not your, not your keys, not your coins. And yeah, it's, it would be, if they did 6102, it, it would be simple. Call up Coinbase, call up Fidelity, call up every major ETF provider and say, you know, sorry guys, the laws have changed. We need to defend the US dollar. Our currency is failing. Um, everybody who's in Bitcoin, cash them out at, at this new price and uh, send them the cash and, um, you know, send, send those coins you own, just, you know, give them to us kind of thing. And, um, I, I, that's a possibility. It's a very real possibility. Where, and so if you've self-custody, um, they can't get them. So that, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah well said, Larry. I, like to me, it's, you know, being a student of history, I think I love, I love Jim Rogers quote of, you know, the first lesson of history is that most people don't learn from history and it's, uh -huh. you know, most people, you know, it's not even taught in school anymore. I, I, I saw some college, they don't even require a class of history to graduate with a history degree. And, and we have people, <laughs> we have people that are, you know, to me, like, it's so obvious, like you do, we just went through four years of people getting denied life-saving care from a hospital because they didn't have something injected inside them. And then I've got, you know, a brokerage, you know, accounts, or I've got, uh, you know, pensions, or you've got insurance people saying, well, your stuff's safe with us, you, you can do it. Like, what do you mean it's safe with you? And you just mentioned Joel Calasari, who I know you've argued, like, I've argued with him the same thing. And, and like, whether it's CBDCs too, and like, well, there's rules in place. And this and that. the government can change things on a dime whenever they want. And if no one stands up, the 3% or the 1% don't stand up and the good people and, and voice their opinion, then they'll do whatever they want. And I think that's the thing that to me, I just, I don't know what else people are seeking and in, in trying to grasp that to say, you know what, it, it is different this time. And things will, you know, they'll just do what we want them to do. I, to me, that just blows my mind. Like how, yeah, I mean, the there, 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 there are a lot of, there are a lot of examples of government changing the rules to benefit the people in power and the people with money. I mean, they, you know, they, um, they got rid of glass Steagall. They, you know, banned short selling. I mean, I mean, it goes back to the Hunt brothers. I mean, the Hunt brothers had the silver market corner yeah. and they changed the rules, you know, and prevented them from selling. Um, you know, a more recent example is what happened with, um, you know, GameStop, you know, a great movie, that movie, Dumb Money and, and you know, how basically yes. Ken Griffin, you know, rigged, rigged the game in his favor. I mean, it, this is this is what they do. They've, they've got the levers of power. They control the government. They got a ton of a ton of money. And. I think to, to suggest that when it gets really critical, they won't do some desperate things. I just think that's naive uh, because every piece of evidence historically suggests that that's what they'll do. What, why, like, where does this come from though? And again, maybe it's not knowing history and people have been brainwashed for so long. And again, I, these are some of my own opinions. It feels obvious. I know a lot of Bitcoiners feel this way, but just seeing people accept government when as we know, the, the Declaration of Independence says it itself, you know, government works for the people, not the other way around. And I yeah. encounter so many people that are even conservative, like on the right in modern you know, Amer American politics who say, well, the government won't let us do that. Or like the government's not going to let us use Bitcoin. And it's like, we, you, we are the government. You realize that. Like if we well, just say, hey, change it, they need to change it. And people just uh, can't seem to grasp that. Yeah, that's the theory. I mean, unfortunately, we're so far away from the Constitution and the <laughs> Constitutional Republic and what they set up. I mean, it's you know, we've got kind of an, uh, an aristocracy slash oligarchy with, you know, the people in government and the, and the wealthy people who just kind of set all the rules and, and totally tip the playing board in their favor. And, um, you know, if you can't see that, you know, shame on you. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people see it. And that's, but I, I think the, here's the sad part, Brandon, my, my view is that, uh, a lot of people see it. I mean, you, you see it in the, you know, see it in the voting, you see it just everywhere. And people are kind of, people are pissed off. People know something's wrong. They know it's broken. What's disappointing to me about it is that they don't really see the underlying cause. You know, they think it's because blue guys in power, red guys in power, but you know, they, they're pointing fingers and they're arguing over stuff that doesn't matter or, or it matters a lot less than the, the fundamental base layer of money, which is really what allowed it all to happen and go in the wrong direction. And it's only getting worse. Which is why, you know, there's a silver lining here, and that is to say, 
as it only gets worse, we're going to get to a crescendo where, you know, it's going to break beyond repair and we're going to then have to reset and that reset, you know, I mean, I look, I don't know. There was some talk about, you know, uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if he has political ambitions, but there was talk about something like a Michael Saylor running for president. Right. I mean, I think there's an argument. He'll end up one of the wealthiest guys in the world. Um, yeah. He's a libertarian. He's actually a really, you know, great human being. He's, he's you know, very kind and fair and nice. And, you know, I'd much rather have, have him as president than anybody who's on the slate right now. And, um, and so I think that, you know, as um, the Bitcoiners vision of the world unfolds, um, there's a, you know, there's a very good chance that, that the politics will get solved too, uh, in part because, you know, the, the people who don't have Bitcoin will be disadvantaged severely versus the people who do have Bitcoin. And it's, you know, pretty well shown throughout history that the people who end up at the top of the political structure generally have the most money. So, you know, um, and if Bitcoiners have the most money, we're going to elect a Bitcoin president. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. You know? Yeah, it, it's fascinating. I, I, the last year, year and a half, like just being at a conference, like there, I'll catch myself sometimes just like looking around and just like looking at everyone, kind of like people watching and, re and and thinking about that very fact of wow, these people, all these people that we know or are friends with or peers with or whatever it might be that you see that you're shaking a hand with or nodding to, they're going to be some of the wealthiest people in the world. Like a lot of the people that are at conferences yeah. right now. And that's what I think is very cool. Like you said, they're very truly not, not Sam Bankman freed altruistic, but actually altruistic, like actual people that are charitable, hopeful, you know, loving people that that's going to be the, the foundation I of the right. world. I, yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would pick the average Bitcoin or over the average man on the street any day of the week to, yes. you know, to be, in a position of government responsibility. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, it, and I do think they're going to be, you know, crazy rich. I mean, which, you know, I mean, imagine what that means for Max Kaiser. And right. <laughs> some of these are OGs, you know. Right. I've been going to a lot of these conferences. And I've heard all these great stories. And I've met a lot of people who are buying coins at a dollar or two dollars. And, of course, I'm, you know, massively jealous because I bought my first ones at 300. <laughs> I heard a really funny story. One guy was telling me he had a conversation with Kaiser. And Kaiser was thinking, there's a guy, um, some people might know this guy's name, others won't. Um, shit, I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, but K Kaiser was bitching that he paid 30 cents for his coins when Trace Meyer, that's who it is. Trace Meyer oh, paid yeah. 10, 10 cents for his coins. And mm -hmm. Kaiser was thinking, oh, I'm, I, I'm too late. You know, <laughs> I, I, Trace, Trace got twice, you know, three times as many coins as I did because he was only paying 10 cents a coin and I'm paying 30. You know, and so... So it's, you know, to, to Sailor's point that it's going up forever, Laura, I mean, there will come a day when, you know, 20,000, 40,000, 60,000 will seem incredibly cheap. And, and there will be, in my view, in the future, you know, being a whole coiner will be, you know, you're independently wealthy. I mean, just massively independently wealthy. And so, you know, as, as we all know, there are 54 million millionaires in the world, 21 million coins. And, and not, you know, there really aren't 21 because, you know, how many were lost? I mean. It's got to be 10 15 percent so mm -hmm. but anyway if you divide it i mean every millionaire in the world can only have half a coin so and of course most have zero coins and so and and you know there are eight billion people in the world and i mean the other piece of you know the other number that i just find fascinating to me and we should get into the multiplier a little bit because it's just it's it's so stunning what this this whole etf thing has really really caused me it's kind of blown my mind and caused me to think more bullish about this than I was before. I mean, I just, I was mm -hmm. bullish, but not as bullish as I am now. Let me take you through the math. Um, 700 trillion, say, of, you know, fiat denominated assets, cash stocks, bonds, and real estate. Maybe let's, and these are round numbers. Maybe, maybe 350 trillion of that is, um, um, uh, you know, cash and stocks piece of it. 350 is real estate. Okay. So Bitcoin's total market cap today is 1.3 trillion. Of course, not all that's for sale, but that is. So the 1.3 over 350, I mean, what is that? Like a third of a percent, you know, of the total money out there. And so some of that 350 is going to realize that they're being debased and that the only way to protect themselves or the best way to protect themselves is Bitcoin. And they're going to start coming in and try and buy some product out of share of Bitcoin. And what they're going to find is it's hard to buy and hard to buy without shoving up the price, but they are going to shove up the price. And, you know, the, the, you know, I mean, even if you only took, say the bond market is a hundred, say the bond market's a hundred trillion dollars. Okay. Worldwide bond market. Um, let's say even all, if only 10% of the bond market 
comes and says, you know what, we need to hedge against this. We need to get some Bitcoin. Well, that's ten trillion dollars. I mean, that's ten x where we are to almost ten x where we are today. And and by the way, all of that one point three is not for sale. I mean, so you know, I mean that 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 gets you from you know sixty thousand, sixty some odd thousand to six hundred thousand. Um, if if it were just a straight one for one multiplier, but it's not. It's it's better than that because. If you look at, and this is, I found this fascinating. Fred Kruger on Twitter has done some great work on this. Everyone recommend you follow him. It's a Doc Kruger. Eight yeah. billion dollars has gone into Bitcoin since the ETFs got formed. This was a, these numbers are a few days old. Um, Bitcoin has gone up in value by three hundred billion dollars. It went from roughly a trillion to one point three trillion. So that would imply that eight trillion of new flows has shoved the overall value of the asset up by 300%. So that's a 37x multiplier. Now, I'm not saying that the multiplier will always be there. And, you know, you, what do you mean by multiplier? Well, what I mean is that, you know, as 8 billion tried to buy it, there just wasn't enough available supply, you know, to, to convince people to sell it, it had to go up that amount. And so, you know, so now think about this, you know, there's, there's 100 billion of bonds and, um, 100 trillion bonds and 10 trillion might come after this even if only 1 trillion came after this you know you would you you would and let's say the multiple let's say the multiplier is not 37 that's that's exaggerated right now because you know we're just starting and you know the ETFs are a new thing let's say it goes down to 5 or 10 that would still you know represent in just enormous growth i mean if one if 1 trillion of bonds comes after this that's you know 10 trillion you know that need, the thing needs to go up by again you kind of get to 5 or 600 thousand a coin so i mean look you know i mean i i see a world where you know we're going to go through 100 then we're going to go through 200 then we're going to go through 400 we're going to go through a million and eventually you know we, we could go to 100 million which is full hyper bitcoinization i'm not sure if we'll get there or when we'll get there you know they might do a monetary reset before that but um you know i could easily see two three four you know uh, million per coin which is you know serious money so so the you know the the ETF thing has has really it's you know it's and Sailor predicted this he did a great job of saying you know hey folks this is this is one of the few t chances in history to to front run Wall Street you know that, because they just don't understand it and in my speech in Bitcoin Madeira um, I I said you know a similar thing occurred to me of course I blew it in in eighty six you know Microsoft came public you know. In 1986, and it was trading at 14 times uh, trailing earnings and, and growing 40% a year, which is pretty friggin' cheap for a company growing that fast. I bought it, you know, with my with my bonus and my savings, and um, um, you know, and I I had had the experience of meeting Steve Palmer a few years earlier, and he had said to my roommate, he was roommates with my business school roommate, and he had said, "Hey, Larry, this you know, the Sam Stoss thing is going to be on every computer in every household all over the world." You know, hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people are going to use this. It's the base layer of these microcomputers, and they're going to be used to do all kinds of things. This is 40 years ago now, and I couldn't see it. I mean, I kind of got it. I knew he was semi-right, but I didn't fully understand it. And you know, little did I know just how absolutely right he was. Right? I mean, it's you know, Microsoft is a multi-billion-dollar corporation. You know, it's MS-DOS has evolved into you know more Windows and all the other stuff they've got, but. It, but his his software really is the base layer of, of the whole PC world that Apple's come along to. But and you know it's just it's enormously valuable. And you know it's it, you know and, and by the way, back in '86, I also remember how you know um, if you were investing in technology, which I was doing, I was at a venture capital firm, and my job was to pick technology companies. You know, everybody thought you would buy you know hardware, you know, disk drives and memory cards, and graphic cards, and because you know they were real and you could touch them and you know, microcomputers and mini, you know, mini computers. There were, this was a little bit before the clone, the clones were just starting to come out. The IBM PC was introduced in 80 and the clones came out a few years later. Anyway, long story short, you know, everyone was looking at software and they were having trouble with it. They were kind of like, hang on a second. This company sells software, but what is it? You can't touch it. It's just ones and zeros, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. not tangible. You know, they, they, every, every business in the world, I mean, there were service companies in the world and everyone got that, you know, you pay somebody to provide a service and there were people who sold goods, you know, and everyone got that. There were, you know, we've had people, companies selling goods forever, but there was no one who was really selling intellectual property, defensible intellectual property, which is what the Microsoft base layer was for the PC. And, uh, and of course it ate the world. And so, 
you know, I, I tend to kind of think I use that analog as I look at, you know, the, you know, the Bitcoin uh, development, which is really an amazing technological development. Um, and it's, you know, it's the base layer of money, the, the base layer of future money. It's, it's just, it's incredibly obvious to me and compelling that, that someday this will be money. I mean, to everybody that, that our grandkids will transact in cents, you know, you want to, you know, you want a hamburger, that's two cents or, you know, whatever the, whatever the relative pricing will be, you know, the dollar will be kind of gone. It'll just be something antique. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's pretty extreme to say that. And the people don't like me saying that. And, you know, even, even sailor says, Hey, look, well, you know, let's not talk about that because that's going to freak the other side out, you know, keep that to yourself. Right. But, but, you know, I think most of us who study it and understand how Gresham's law works, uh, eventually come to that conclusion that once it becomes obvious to everybody that this is a better form of money, which it is because it can't be debased and it's, it's algorithmically programmed to, you know, expand at a, at a asymptotically decreasing rate, um, then, you know, it's kind of game over for other currency. And as Saylor also pointed out when he made a speech and stage in Madeira, he said, you know, the next 10 years are really going to be the great gold rush years for this. It's, you know, cause we're, we're kind of at the 10% adoption point. So we're now going to really adoption is going to accelerate. And we're also, you know, we've still got mining reward, you know, 6.25 today, soon to be 3.125, et cetera, et cetera. And, and until 2034, there will be decent mining reward. At, in 2034, 90%, 99% of the Bitcoin that's ever going to be mined will have been mined. And there'll only be 1% left and it takes another 100 years for the balance. So, so at that point, effectively, you've got, you know, a stock to flow that's, there's almost no flow. You know, when you when you got one percent coming in over the course of a year or a uh, hundred years, that's not much flow. So um, it, it becomes incredibly hard money at that stage, and um, you know it's it's going to be much much higher than it is today. And I, I think I think even some of us who are in it are going to be shocked. And I say that because um, it's a you know it, it, people would say, well, it sounds too good to be true. You know, that can't be possible. You know, what, what do you about etc and and I, I say well you know let me draw an analogy you know you, you you teleported down to somebody living in the United States in 1900 and you said to them you know there's going to be this thing called the airplane it's going to be invented by the Wright brothers and in you know in 1960 you know 60 years from now you know whatever you're going to be able to fly from New York to LA in four hours you know instead of it being a 38 hour train ride right and the person will look at you and say, you're fucking nuts. I mean, that's just, uh, there's no way that's not going to happen. Man can't even fly. You know, that's, that's a pipe dream. And, and so, but the airplane got invented and, you know, and then it got it slow in the beginning and it got perfected and better and better. And, and sure enough, in the 60s, people were flying across country in four hours. And, and so I, I, I kind of think it's, it's similar here. I mean, um, you know, this, this thing got invented. It, it only got invented 15 years ago. The first years were really rocky. I mean, I didn't go all in because I was afraid of the technology. I was afraid it might blow up. I wish I had been less afraid like Max. I mean, Max kind of went all in. And, um, and it's, you know, we're, we're now, you're still, you know, people, I, I've had friends I've tried Orange Pill and they, you know, recently and said, oh, shit, I should have listened to you when I was 15. I should have listened to you when I was 15. I missed it. It's too late. I can't pay 60 something for this. You know, I already, no, <laughs> you can. Because if it's really going to go to half a million, a million, two million, 60s cheap, you know, I mean, there will come a time when it won't be cheap. I mean, there'll come a time when it'll kind of, you know, it's fully distributed and its growth will, you know, kind of echo the growth in productivity and the improvements in society. But we're a long ways away from that, you know, yeah. we're at least 10 years away from that. So, um, you know, it's, it, to me, it's, it's just obvious. And uh, I hope more people wake up to it because, and that's, and the reason I'm such a big advocate for it is that I know it'll make the world a better place. And, you know, I think it's important. I, I want to try and save people from, you know, dying in the legacy system because the legacy system is going to die. I mean, and there will be pain for people, which is sad, but it, it just is. And, you know, I mean, just like there was pain. I mean, if you're in the buggy whip business and the automobile got yep. introduced, you were fucked. I mean, you know, if you're making, you know, buggy, you know, carriages, you're making horse-drawn carriages, you were fucked. I mean, it just, it happens. It's sorry, but that's how it happens. And, 
it's kind of a similar model here. So, yeah, people try you know recognizing patterns. Some you know some do, and a lot of a lot don't. You know, makes a me lot think don't. That, yeah, and, and they're not yeah. willing to listen to it. And they think it's too good to be true. I mean, I look, I get all this. All, I get all the fud, you know, and and I also get. I mean, I think it's to me it's tragic. I mean, it created a great opportunity for some really smart people to buy at fifteen thousand, but. I think it's mm -hmm. tragic what Sam Bankman Fried and all the shitcoins did to the space. I mean, yeah. I think they really set us back quite a bit because, you know, I mean, I, I have a lot of smart friends who are like, I'm not getting involved with that. There are a bunch of frauds in that area. You know, and yes. I mean, I get it. I mean, it's if you're just looking at it cursorily, you know, I get it. You know, yeah, Sam Bankman Fried was a master fraud. I mean, we all we all knew it. We were telling him. We were we were writing letters to the SEC saying you got to investigate this guy. This is bad shit. But you know, and, and as we all know, Bitcoin's not a shit coin. You know, it's, it's completely different than all those other coins. But, you know, to somebody who's lazy or just hasn't taken the time to do the work, they could easily conclude that, you know, this is just another one of those. So I get it. I mean, that's, and that's, you know, the, yeah, you know, you know all that. <laughs> Yeah, no, and, it, and and this makes me think of numerous things like, you know, there's no top on Bitcoin because there's no bottom to fiat. And again, some of these are novel ideas for the average person, the average normie or pre-coiner is Correct. just starting to understand these things. And it makes Correct. me like deflation, like Bob Burnett has a great way of under, of explaining deflation. Why do people, in your opinion, why do people have such a hard time? Like you get so many people, the MMTers, the Stephanie Keltons, all these people are like, deflation can't work. You can't have uh, deflationary money and all, why, like. Can you explain, like, once and for all, yeah. why? <laughs> what what well, is my, wrong with these my, people? My view on all of that is what I, and I think a lot of the problems and all that, what you described, it's all really kind of driven by recency bias. I mean, you know, first of all, we haven't had, well, we had two, well, the U.S. has been in, a, an incredibly stable currency for a reasonably long period of time. Okay, we had mm -hmm. hyperinflation in, in when the country was formed, when the continental was overprinted. Yes. And by the way, that's why the Constitution got written, saying that only gold and silver could be money. And of course, yes. we violated that, but that's a different story. <laughs> the other thing we did is we had huge inflation in the Civil War when you know, Lincoln printed greenbacks and you know, effectively kind of inflated the money supply and so forth. But, but other than that, it's been a pretty stable place um, because as, you know, it's interesting to me, and I'm sure you've seen this too, and we go to the shows, you know, people from other countries tend to get it more than Americans get it. And that's because if you lived in Brazil or you lived in Argentina or you lived in Hungary or you lived in Israel or you lived in a lot of other countries that were not the reserve currency, you've had high inflation, sometimes hyperinflation, Venezuela, you know, and so and you recognize that currencies die. They're not always sound. The, the U.S. happens to be, you know, until 71, a reasonably well-managed currency that didn't die. And since 71, it's been mismanaged. But because it was the world reserve currency and a lot of history behind it. We had all the guns and everything else, you know, it's the, the death process has taken some time, but it is dying. I mean, in terms of raw purchasing power, the dollars lost 97% of its value since we went off the gold standard in 71. And that last 3% is just, you know, we're, we're hanging on by a thread. That 3% is going to go to zero. So, yeah. um, yeah. So I, I think it's, yeah. I think it's kind of a recency bias and, um, the MMT is, and Keynes, I mean, they, they they got sold on the notion, <laughs> excuse me, that growth is good and the bigger numbers are good. And, mm -hmm. and let's face it, it, it is an actual natural human, you know, psychology philosophy to want to see number go up. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, and if your yeah. wage, I mean, let, let's just take an example. If your wages are going up every year, it feels good. If right. the price, if the value, if the price of your house, the market price of your house is going up every year. That feels good, you know. I mean, you like it. Okay, I paid this in my house. Now, if there's equal inflation to the wages, you didn't get ahead. You know, your your, your wage went up and your cost went up. So you, you, but you know, all things being equal, you felt better that you're making higher wage. You felt better that your house was worth more. And so, you know, in Keynes, they they, they came out of the depression. The prices of everything had collapsed. It terrified people. It was a horrible experience. And Kate said, look, we've got to, we've got to stoke these animal spirits by printing money, MMT, et cetera, to, you know, when, when the market delivers us a bust, it's the government's role to try and counter the bust and create growth, even if it's only nominal growth, not real growth. Um, the reason I think MMTers and all these people don't, what they don't understand is that pre the formation of the Fed, fractional reserve banking, and, you know, so on and so forth, when we were really kind of more on a gold standard, 
in the 1800s, prices were actually relatively fixed. But what happened is productivity went up. So wages went up because productivity went up and costs went down. And so, you know, if you were making the same salary, you know, in five years that you're making today, but the cost of everything you bought was lower, you'd actually be gaining net wealth. But it might not feel like that because you say, well, I'm just making the same salary. Well, yeah, okay. But if, if you know, if, if we lived in a world where productivity was actually flowing through to the consumer because it wasn't being raked off by the cotillionaires who get to borrow at zero, um, you know, it's Jeff Booth's point, we would all the world will be abundant and getting more and more abundant with every year because every year technology and, and efficiencies allow us to do more with less. I mean, you know, I look at what's happened since the seventies, say, just think of all the technical, I mean, look at us, we're talking here on, a, you know, this, we're talking on a zoom call, yeah. you know, that I pay $150 a year to be a zoom member, which is nothing. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, you had to have specialized equipment to do a video call. You know what I mean? And, yes. and, uh, you know, when I first cell phones came out, you know, in Gordon Gecko days in the eighties, and I remember my boss got one and he was paying a dollar a minute, you know, to, to make yeah. a cell phone call, right. You know, and mm -hmm. now you can have, you know, for, I don't know, 15, 30 bucks a month, you know, you can have unlimited calls. I mean, it, it just, things are, things are constantly, the world is constantly getting better. Um, the problem is that, um, the monetary system is designed in a way that it, it's debt fueled. And, and, and if things, if, if number doesn't go up, the debt drowns you. And so, you know, so what you've got is what Jeff Booth points out, which is you've got a monetary system that's fighting the natural face forces of deflation. And, you know, deflation is good. Deflation implies efficiency. And, and, and Keynes was wrong in that he thought growth is what matters and, and numbers should go up in everything and, and so on and so forth. And, and what, the, what the classical economists, what the Austrians understood was, no, 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 you know, those number go up can be just a bubble. You know, what we really need is we need, we need the more goods for the same price. We need more efficiency. That's all, you know, that's productivity uh, and efficiency. And, and we don't have a chance of getting that when you've got Federal Reserve, you know, I mean, Federal Reserve sets the price of money. The price of money is the base layer of the entire financial system of all of capitalism. You know, what, what it costs you to borrow determines whether you borrow or not. If interest rates are 20%, you're not going to borrow unless you have one hell of a project. If interest rates are zero, you're going to borrow and speculate because, hey, what the hell? It doesn't cost me much to do it. And what that interest rates at zero has done is it's led to just huge misallocations of capital. Um, the interest rate is something that should be set as a balance between those who have savings and those who need capital to pursue projects. And so, you know, there will be debt. There will be borrowing, probably less of it on a Bitcoin standard, but there will be debt. And, you know, that interest rate will be set in a way, in a manner such that, um, you know, it'll only, you'll only borrow if you think the project you're pursuing gives you, you know, enough return over and above the cost of borrowing and, and some error, you know, some margin of error. Um, and by the way, interest rates might be pretty low because you'd be thinking, I mean, today interest rates get set sometimes highly on projects because everyone knows you're getting paid back into base money. I mean, if you thought your money was going up in real terms, two or 3% a year, which is kind of the growth of productivity in the world you know, you might be willing to lend at a pretty low interest rate, recognizing that you're going to get paid back in, in sats that will have appreciated, right? So um, it's just a different, it's just shifting your mindset. And, um, and it's, you know, it, 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 there's so many pieces of how we got here. I mean, you know, probably the guy I credit the most for screwing the whole thing up is Bernanke. I mean, he, you know, claimed <laughs> to be a scholar of the Great Depression, and he just got he, it wrong. Larry, he's a Nobel Prize winner. Nobel Peace Prize winner. Come on. I know. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, I want this, and they can, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes, right? I mean, it, it's <laughs> I mean, like, the guy's a fraud, in my opinion. I mean, mm -hmm. he, you know, he misinterpreted the Great Depression and rather than recognize that it was a bubble driven by, you know, low interest rates and, and Fed largesse, um, <clears throat> he thought that was all normal and that the crash was a function of the Fed not printing enough money. Um, but any, you know, at, at some birthday party for Milton Friedman, he, he said, yeah, we blew it in the thirties, but thanks to you, we'll never blow it again. And of course, in 2008, very soon after that, he got a chance to prove that as he took the fed balance sheet from 800 billion to 3.7 trillion. So, um, yeah, I mean, he, to me, he's the, you know, the intellectual, you know, uh, champion of this whole thing. He had a his famous speech at Google at the 2002 helicopter speech. You should read it. 
yeah. listen to it. I mean, I talked about how, That's you know, deflation, it can't happen yeah, here. We, we, we can't, yeah, we can't have yeah. deflation here because we've got the technology called the printing press and we'll just print money. And yes. I mean, what, a, what an irresponsible and stupid thing to say, um, you know, as, as if, I mean, as if <clears throat> what country in the history of the world has ever improved the well-being of its citizens by printing money. I mean, there's, there's never, show me an example where that has worked. Right. I mean, I, I don't think you can find one. So, you know, I, I, I mean, this, and this guy's our central banker, but you know, he, he was very well paid. I mean, that, that the whole system that they've got makes the people who play the game fabulously rich, including him. <laughs> Excuse me. I mean, he's an advisor for Citadel now, and he's rumored to get paid twenty million bucks a year. It's it's remarkable, and I I, I have a, a minute clip we I could play here. It's the you know the FDIC yeah. roundtable from the end of twenty twenty two when they're admitting that people have more confidence in the banking system than they do. They're in that room. Uh, you've got the New Zealand, you know, I, I know, I think Nico, uh, your show a couple of weeks ago with Nico, you guys played yeah. the clip with the New Zealand central bankers saying it's a great game. Yep. We just print money and people believe it. And then you've got yeah. the Euro. I don't know if you saw recently the Euro. It was a, it was an old prime minister. I don't know who it was. It was some, some former leader, I think in the Euro zone. And he had said like, we got a bunch of just stagnant Euro sitting in bank accounts doing nothing. Like we can just take those. And balance, I mean, just balance everywhere. And people just think like this, this, these things aren't going to happen. Like they're, they're laying all the pipe down and like people are going to be surprised one day when this happens. Yeah. It's incredible. Well, yeah. There's that fellow who wrote that book, the great taking. I mean, you know, it's, it's very hard to know what will and what won't happen, but I, you know, yeah. I think to, to assume that some of these bad things won't happen is sadly not, you know, you're kind of misinformed. I mean, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure there were people in the 60s who thought, well, we'll never go off the gold standard. Do you know what I mean? And then, yeah, you know, as you recall, Nixon's speech said, we're going to temporarily go off the gold standard in 1971, <laughs> right? Well, how's that temporary piece working out? I mean, all relative. You yeah. Know, I mean, and, and I mean, back to the, the government breaking the rules. I mean, yes. You know, let's go back to 6102. You know, in 1933, Roosevelt realized they were in a depression. He realized that they needed a monetary reset, that they've had massive deflation going on. So he had to devalue the dollar in terms of gold. Well, what did he do? He, you know, he called in all the gold and said, you know, you don't come in, you don't give us your gold at in today's dollar price. You know, we're going to send you to jail and find you $10,000 and so on and so forth. I mean, literally confiscated, you know, people's gold wealth. And then, you know, six months later, he repriced gold and devalued it's you know devalued the dollar in gold terms seventy percent. So everyone who had just given their gold, you know, there's people holding gold were holding it to protect themselves against guys like him, and they just got devalued by seventy percent. And then, of course, a lot of those gold holders went and they sued him, and they you know they tried to you know this is illegal. You can't take this shit and not confiscate it, conf uh, compensate us for it. And you know, I went to the Supreme Court, and of course, he packed the Supreme Court, and he lost, and they lost. I mean, this is you know this is the government playing by the government's rules. I mean, I don't think there's anybody who looking at that case today would say that was fair. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But, but, you know, but that's what happened. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, when, when you're the president and, you know, you're, you're talking about the national interest, I mean, you can do these things. I mean, you know, those of us who are in the gold world, we've, we've forensically looked at it very carefully. We've seen all the things they did to suppress the, suppress the price of gold. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that there's, there's overwhelming evidence that they've, they've done that. I mean, you know, something as simple as Paul Volcker in his, in his memoir said, yeah, one of the mistakes we made in the 70s is we didn't do enough to suppress the price of gold. In other words, we were suppressing it, but we didn't do it. We didn't suppress it enough. Right. So, okay. You know, is that really the role of the government to be suppressing gold? I mean, you know, I don't think so. But, um, you know, it's, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I often view the government as uh, the government as a criminal gang. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's, it's like a Legal virus. Language. It's it, yeah. their, their job is to keep themselves in power. Their job yeah. is not to serve us. It's not to make the country better. It's not to do, I mean, you know, to the degree that they keep themselves in power by doing some of those things, well, then they coincide and that'll happen. But, but in general, job number one is stay in power and, yeah. and do not, do not rock the boat. You know I mean? And, you know, we see it everywhere. Like how, how does Elizabeth Warren who went to Congress, you know, as a law professor, you know, and the consultant, but, you know, making hundreds of thousands a year. I mean, how she end up with a $60 million net worth? I mean, huh? You know, I mean, what's that? I mean, that's, 
you know, I mean, she, you know, I mean, it's just, and, and she's not the only one, right? There, there's, Thank so, you, Larry. I mean, Larry, did you see? I just saw a tweet the other day, actually, or it was like this week. It was uh, like yeah. Nancy Pelosi's up like a hundred million oh, on her oh, NVIDIA oh, call options or something. Yeah. yeah. No, some, I think somebody actually created a fund, like a Nancy Pelosi stock trader fund where they follow her. And I think right. it's up like 40% this year. I mean, yeah, because she has to file everything she does. I mean, you know, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, or or take, I mean, uh, there's another example of the corruption. I mean, take Janet Yellen, right? She was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, chairman of the Fed, she's now treasury secretary. I mean, you know, she got paid $7 million in speaking fees by a bunch of financial institutions. Now, you can't tell me that she really provided $7 million worth of value. Just speak. No, all of these banks just viewed it as tribute. You know, we'll, we'll give her two hundred dollars or $300,000 to come give a speech because we know that when the shit hits the fan and we need to be able to make a phone call and get the help that we need to bail us out, that the fact that we've given her this bribe will make sure that she helps us. You know, I mean, I mean, that, that's why Bernanke is on the board of Citadel or a consultant to Citadel. I mean, in 2020, this is pretty funny, too, because there was a, an HBS event I went to and a lot of people were there. And we talked about the Citadel case. And in 2020, in March of 2020, Citadel was bankrupt. They, they, they clearly were. The, the basis trade had completely blown up. And um, and they called up Bernanke, I'm sure, because he's their advisor. And they and Bernanke called the guys at the Fed and they got a swap line. You know, they got kind of an unlimited swap line to, you know, to ride it out. And so Citadel didn't go bankrupt because they're paying Bernanke as a consultant and Bernanke used his power in government to get them a swap line. Now, you know, all that is denied, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that it's true. Um, you know, so that's what we're dealing with here. I mean, it's it's two sets of rules. There's a rule set of rules for the insiders and the rules for the rest of us. And, um, and fiat, in, fiat incentivizes that, right? I mean, that's yeah. It, it's well, that's exactly right. It, yeah, it, it incentivizes that. And, you know, if, um, we're not we're not playing a fair game, you know, we're, we're playing a very unfair game, which is why, you know, I mean, I, I mean, you know, the average working stiff in this country, you know, has to pay 20 percent on their credit card or you know, something close to that. And mm -hmm. and yet, you know, Wall Street can borrow, you know, at the Fed funds rate, which now is five and a quarter, but used to be zero, you know, and uh, I mean, that's just an enormous advantage. I mean, you give me that deal. And I'd become rich. I mean, it'd be simple. You borrow at zero and buy 10% yielding securities and just and then do it again and lever it up. I mean, you know, no, no mystery. I mean, this is how this is how you've got all these people who've made you know, private equity people, Wall Street people, you know, financial players who do nothing but shuffle paper, who've managed to create millions and millions and millions of wealth of dollars of wealth for themselves, you know, at the at the expense of the rest of us. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really it's quite problematic. I mean, but I mean, you know, the beautiful thing is Satoshi saw it, you know, solved this problem and it's going to make all of our lives a lot better. Um, and, and all we have to do is really sit back and watch it unfold. I mean, to the degree that we want to participate and make it go faster, you know, as sailor said in his speech at Bitcoin Atlantis, I highly recommend people to listen to that speech. I think it's one of his best ones. Um, you know, it's it's incumbent, you know, ask now what Bitcoin can do for you, ask what you can do for Bitcoin. You know, it's it's the job of those of us who understand it to communicate that to everybody who doesn't understand it um, yes. for a number of reasons. One, because they save themselves and help them out. But two, because it'll just push this transition along more quickly. And it, the, this transition is what will make the world a much better place on the other side. So, how, um, so how do you, it's like I've got, you know, for I've got, you know, all kinds of Bitcoin trading cards around here. You can see it back here. Yeah. Obviously. We're gonna, at some point, we're going to have the general, general Lawrence Lepard in the cards um, in the. I think the so. Cards. Yeah. Somebody was somebody did a design yeah. of it. Told me about it. I don't, yeah. yeah. So it, that's coming for everybody here in the in the future here. But to this point of education, like you said, I mean, to, uh, you, you shared a, a good book about JFK, uh, I don't know, a year ago yeah. with me. And I think I messaged you on Twitter. I, I did it publicly so that way other people could see it too instead of DMing you. But I wanted it out there publicly just to be like, hey, just continue getting education out there, whether it's trading cards or fun ways to orange pill people and accept truth, like a Trojan horse, like Bitcoin is, whether it's cards or fun things. 
what do, what do you do to help educate people? Because obviously going to them and saying, hey, let's talk about JFK or, hey, let's talk about the intelligence agencies or the Federal Reserve. Like these things are not easy to talk about, but it is the, the, the genesis that's the foundation of understanding a lot of what we're talking about now. Like what, do you, what are yeah. you doing? Yeah, it's a big, deep rabbit hole. I mean, I probably the thing I do the most of is I, I, I bought a lot of, I give out a lot of like copies of Safe's book because I just think it's the best primer to the whole, you know, area. Mm-hmm. Um, I usually, I don't start with the fact the CIA killed Kennedy or, you know, the government's completely corrupt because you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that. And, and they think I'm <laughs> on the, they think I'm on the fringe and, you know, it, it kind of disqualifies you. I, I generally just start with something that they, I know they basically understand, which is to say, we've got a real inflation problem. I mean, hard to find anyone who would disagree with you on that, right? Because right. they, they, they know what the cost of living is. They know that food's gone, you know, and okay. So now I've got their attention. And then I just kind of talk that through with them and try and explain that, you know, there's a reason for that. And it's not because corporations are greedy, you know, it's, it's because of the way, right. As, as you know, Warren and, and Liz Warren, yeah. Biden would say, you know, it has nothing to do with that. It's because, you know, the money's broken and, uh, and, you know, furthermore, it's, it's, it's sad, but that's, you know, it's going to get worse. Right. Um, and so, for a country you know, that loves band-aids on bullet holes, Larry. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the yeah. corporations are greedy. The cookie monster doesn't have enough cookies in his bag. It's shrinkflation. It's logistics yeah. problems. Putin price all hike. That. These are all downstream. All that. Exactly. Oh. And so, it, you know, it's um, – I just try and walk them through, you know, all of the, the monetary problems we've got and how clear it is. And then I try to explain to them that, you know, there's a solution. And, and this is the solution. And then – you know, sometimes they want to go down all those other rabbit holes as well, and I'm happy to do that. But, but I, I think that you know, I mean, they don't have to believe that the CIA killed Kennedy to accept Bitcoin. I mean, you know, you can you can kind of get to right. you can get you know, to Bitcoin. Yeah, you right. can get to Bitcoin pretty simply. You know, and, and and it's it's interesting too because, you know, you would think. I mean, I find the hardest people to orange pill are the people who are really deep in fiat and made all their money in fiat because it it, it mm-hmm. runs against their beliefs. They don't like it. Yeah. Whereas you know, just kind of a simple cab driver, blue collar worker, you know, they get it. I mean, they get it really quickly, right? You know, here's this thing that, you know, the, the reason, the reason prices are going up is because they're printing money. Okay. Most people can get that. All right. So imagine if we had a kind of money that the government couldn't print by definition, the, the, the algorithm prevents the government from printing it. And then, you know, okay. And then they usually have some questions about, well, is it real and is it going to work and how do I, you know, it's complicated. I mean, they're, they're, they're all the issues that we all encounter. And, you know, you get all the various things. Well, I can't touch it. You know, the gold guys say that or you get the, um, you know, um, and they're, they're, you know, there's FUD, right? There are lots of right. varieties of FUD. But, you know, those of us who have been in Bitcoin for a while, we kind of know the answer to every type of FUD. You know, OK, it's MySpace versus Facebook. Well, right. yeah, and maybe it was in the beginning, but. You know, this is so far out in front now. There's nobody's ever going to catch up with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Facebook's yeah, not going to get replaced. Google's not going right. to get replaced. I mean, it's, you know, and the network grows every, you know, Sailor says every addition to the network strengthens the network. And the network right. is growing very rapidly. I mean, I was at a meetup the other night. I'm not sure this guy had the right numbers, but, I, you know, if it's true, it's really quite stunning. And he said that there's some site that tracks the number of wallet downloads. I don't know how to get that information, but. And, and, you know, worldwide wallet downloads is running something like a million a day now, Um, you know, right. And so, so 365, so so we're we're down 300 million wallets are getting downloaded a year. I mean, you know, this is, this is growth. And he, and he said he had the trend curve and it was, you know, a year ago was less and two years ago was less. And, you know, it's just, that just kind of continues to grow every single year, every single day. And so. You know, as we all know, the hash rate grows. We all know the number of coins that aren't moving at 70%. Yeah, that's growing. Grow and grow. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, as long as all of these user metrics are growing, I really don't see, you know, it's, and people say, what's well, going to crash? Like, Why? You know, what, yeah. what am I missing? Here? Wow. Do you know what right. I mean? I mean, right. um, there's, I, I can't see what's, what's the catalyst for the crash. I mean, I can see, though, the government throwing sand in our eyes. I mean, I can mm-hmm. see. Yeah high taxes, you got to report. I mean, there's, you know, the government's pretty good at using FUD and they will, you know, particularly as it gets to the point where they really realize what a a threat it is, 
you know, they might come out with some very serious FUD. Um, you know, for those of us who've been in it a while and are used to the drawdowns, we're going to be like, yeah, okay, so what? I ain't right. selling. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it ain't dying. And, and in fact, you know, gosh, uh, this drawdown is really nice. I, I'm going to buy some more sats. Right. You know? Yeah. So the logs, you mentioned this a second ago, network effect. And I know we'll, we'll wrap here in the, in the, in the, in a handful of minutes here. I know you're, we're getting over an hour here. Um, the log chart really was one of the things, cause I was, I was similar to you. I mean, you have much more experience than I do, but after the 08, 09 crash seeing, I was very political and I, I got into Robert Kiyosaki and Mike Maloney, you know, right. the guy investing in gold and silver. And I was like, you know, I could see there's a game being played. Both sides were in on that's what, that was my window into that. No way as a senior at Michigan state and leaving and going to play professional hockey. And I'm just, I would spend all my time researching and studying and, and I realized, wow. And then you're getting into creature from Jekyll Island and into the, yep. you know, and so learning what invisible crashes and measuring assets against each other and how to actually figure out real value of things. And the long chart though, so fast forward five, six years to similar to your story, like 2017 in that, that's where Bitcoin really made sense to me over gold and silver. It was the network effects and bringing everyone together, Metcalf's law and everything. That was, that was huge for me. And really, instead of just seeing a linear chart of like, oh, it's just crashing up and down. It was, no, there's a, there's a growth to this. There's a network yeah. being built. And that was huge. Well, what higher was, highs and higher lows, right? Correct. And you could, correct. You could see the adoption. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was your, what was your like, you know, story really from transitioning from gold to, to Bitcoin and seeing that, was it something similar yeah. to that? Or how did you kind of make that jump? Similar. To, oh, I, I, you know, I, I kind of sensed it was a faster horse. The volatility mm -hmm. obviously was a concern, but I, you know, I could get over that. The, um, like I said, I bought my first ones in 2013. I paid 300 and something. Um, the, my, my concern um, is, was always technology related. I, 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 you know, I thought, great, programmatic money that can't be printed. Yeah, I'm all for that. Um, but, if, you know, you, you're probably as familiar with this, but I've been a you know, gold guy for years and years, a sound money guy for 20 plus years. People tried to do this before. I mean, there were a bunch of precursors to Bitcoin. There was e-gold, and I'm trying to remember the names of them. But there, were, there were four or five other attempts at creating, quote unquote, digital internet money. Um, and they all failed and they all failed because they couldn't prevent the double spending problem. You know, the, the, you know, the Byzantine generals problem didn't get, didn't get really solved. They, they had pieces of the puzzle, but not all of the pieces. And so, so I was disadvantaged that when Bitcoin came out in 2013, you know, in 2009, 10, 11, I thought, oh yeah, that's nice, but this is going to fail too. Right. Cause I'm just looking at, you know, yes. people tried this, it doesn't work. Um, and so. Yeah. What it took for me to get more and more conviction was uh, really spending enough time digging deep enough, meeting enough technologists who explained, you know, the having and the SHA-256 and the, the blockchain and, and, you know, the elegance of it all. And it just continued to work. I mean, it was, you know, when it, I mean, and if you talk to some of the core developers in 2013, even they would admit that they weren't sure, mm -hmm. you know, that there were issues and they closed some back doors as late as 2017, 18, 19. I mean, there were... You know, you had block war. You had the block wars. I mean, you know, they could have expanded the block size more, and that would have potentially led to trouble. Um, you had the forks. You know, the hard forks, and uh, mm -hmm. most of them, yeah. you know, they went to zero. But I got them all, and I sold what I could. It was liquid. I sold. Um, you know, so so I would say in my case, it wasn't really, it, it, and and it was one thing to go from a couple dollars, ten dollars to a hundred, and a hundred to a thousand, but it was kind of bouncing around there. I think when in in 17, that ripped to 17,000, that was like a wake-up call. I was like, holy shit, this thing is explosive. You know what I mean? This this is, we're not kidding around here. And, and so now you'd had, I think at that point, you'd had three or four down cycles where it'd come back. Um, you know, whereas, and, and before I kind of thought, well, each one of these could be the bursting of the bubble. But, you know, it just kept coming back. And so... I got very comfortable after the 2017 decline to 10 and then four that to buy more. And, and it just, my, my confidence in it kept growing. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it hasn't had any problems. I mean, it's worked, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. I mean, occasionally you'll have, you know, two chains that'll, you know, go alongside each other for a few, for a block or two. And then right. the longer one reconciles and the other one goes away. So, I mean, there've been, you know, you, you can't always know your, your transactions confirmed in 10 minutes, but, but I mean, it's, it's worked, it's worked flawlessly. And so somewhere along there. And, and, and then of course seeing sailor, who's a rocket scientist get involved and, you know, obviously he's, you know, very technology savvy for him to get comfortable with it. And it's, 
you know, you just, your confidence kind of continues to grow that the, the technology to sound. So for me, it was always a, a sound technology issue, um, but also, you know, adoption. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as adoption continued to increase, I, you know, I got more and more comfortable with it. Um, and I think now, I mean, in some ways now, I mean, some people have said that, you know, it's, it's actually a better bet now in the 60s with all the data we have behind us than it was, you know, at five yeah. or 10 when, you know, it was 2018 or something. And yeah. there were still issues that were unresolved or certainly versus the 13, 14, 15. I think there were a lot of unresolved issues. It was very hard for me at that time. to think I'm going to put a ton of money into this, this mm-hmm. new experimental money. You know what I mean? Yes, it was hard. I agree. Um, but, but some people did and God bless them. I mean, they did extraordinarily well. Yeah. What do you last two things here? Uh, what yeah. um, the there's I mean, so many things that we'll do it, you know, maybe in a few months, we'll do we'll do another one. There's I have sure. a list of how long things I want to get you with, but I want to be cognizant of your time. What so I, I just saw someone saying this, um, that the debt could hit, in their opinion, 40 trillion by the end of uh, this year. Um, and I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know who it was. I don't know if it was someone in the Bitcoin space, if it was. I don't know if it's the end of this year. I think it might have been the end of next year. I think. Maybe it's the end of next year. Yeah. And we're I, adding a trillion every 100 days. So, add, so we're at 34. So that would imply that in a year we'll be at 37. Yeah. No, maybe it's not even the end of next year, but sometime next year we'll be at 40. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're yeah. running at a rate to hit 40 pretty quickly. We So my big question to this, like a year ago, year and a half, or maybe it's like being two years ago when I. I was ma- I was making some content and I people really just like, oh, there's no way. I was like, the dollar can lose 99% of its value again from here. And we could be at 100 Crazy. trillion by the end of the decade. And people were just like, Crazy. oh, what are you talking about? And I was like, it's exponential. You know, like how, how does this oh, yeah. game play out to you at the end of the day? Like, where do we go? How does this transition yeah. off the Titanic? Well, and, that, and, that, and by the way, that's the, you know, <laughs> I've often said, I think this, you know, we get to hyper Bitcoinization in the 2035 area, but, you know, it could come much sooner. It really could. I just don't want to predict that and be wrong. I mean, I've, all along, I've been thinking to myself, well, I mean, look, when 2008 happened, I thought the dollar was going to die. Right? And obviously, True. I was very wrong. You know? yeah, so no, that's him. I don't, that's I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. I'm, I'm pretty sure this whole thing plays out by the mid 2030s, probably a lot sooner mm-hmm. um, because it is kind of the, you know, suddenly then all at once. And, you know, I, I, I think. I don't, did we talk about Silicon Valley Bank earlier? I mean, I, I like to use the you know, Silicon Valley. That was Bank. one of the things. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I like get to the Silicon Valley even... Bank as a as yeah, a comparable. New York I mean, too, the community. No. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that well, this morning we just bailed that out. But yeah. in, the Silicon Valley, in the Silicon Valley Bank case, you know, they sold some bonds. It was they took a mark down. Some accountants did the math and said, "Holy shit, this thing's worthless." There's twenty million dollars negative equity here. Twenty billion dollars in negative equity. Six days later, the bank was gone. And one of those six days, forty-five billion dollars worth of money went out the door. I mean, it was a digital bank run. It was this was not George Bailey and the you know and the savings and loan. This was right. you know you know one day forty-five percent. So what does that mean? It means that everyone concluded, everyone who was a depositor there, very quickly concluded, oh shit, this thing's no good. I got to get my money out of here, or I'm gonna you know, obviously anything you had on deposit there over and above two hundred fifty thousand dollars was at risk. Of course, it turns out it wasn't because they bailed it out. But um, yeah, so that that kind of contagion, that kind of awareness, that quickness, um, that could apply to a reserve currency. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Now, yeah, you know, it's we're, we're a long ways away from that, I think. But you know, what happens? I mean, you know, here's a scenario: what happens when the U.S. ten-year trades at six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Okay. Cool. Because people aren't trusting it and they're dumping it. Right. Okay. And, uh, and the dollar is going down and people, um, you know, the, the Fed says, well, this is a real problem because, you know, we're going to, we're going to have to pay more interest on all our bonds and the deficits are going to blow out. And so the Fed says, okay, we're coming back in with QE and yield curve control and the amount's going to be unlimited. And, you know, in the first couple of months, it's, it's a big number, you know, it's trillions and trillions and the Fed balance sheet you know, which is now in the sevens, I think it went as high as nine, it's come back down. You know, the Fed balance sheet goes to 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, you know, and, and, and suddenly, you know, what will happen is, Brandon, what I think will happen is that awareness will be spreading of what's happening here. It's like, mm-hmm. oh my God, they have lost control of this monetary system. They cannot, you know, there is a quote unquote, you know, soft run on the dollar. People don't want to hold dollar-denominated bonds. People don't want to hold dollars. 
Um, people are buying things that are an alternative. I'm, by the way, when all this is going on, you know, Bitcoin's call it gone from 200 to 600 quickly. Right. You know, and right. gold's at three or 4,000. So you've got those signals. So, right. you know, those of us who are in the know and people who are aware of monetary economics and how it all works are like, holy shit, this currency's failing. You know, I've seen this movie before. I've seen it in Zimbabwe. I've seen it in Venezuela. I've seen it in Weimar, Germany. And, yes. and then what happens is you get into a, you know, the panic, panicking first is, is the right thing to do. He who panics first panics best. By yeah. panic, I mean, you sell the dollar and you buy something that, that can't be printed, right? And of yes. course, that just makes it worse. And, you know, I'm very much like Silicon Valley, um, you know, everybody in the brother says, get me the hell out of this thing right now. And so Bitcoin goes to a million, you know, and, and of course, a lot of people are afraid to buy it. Like, how the hell can I pay a million for it? Well, guess what? It's going to go to infinity in dollar terms because the dollar is going to go to zero. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'm not predicting this. I'm not saying that's what will happen. Um, I, I have no idea the time frame and I'm not trying to be a doomster. I'm just describing the pattern that has happened when other currencies fail. Now, we've never had, well, other than Rome, which, you know, they debased the denarius over a couple hundred yeah. years to zero. But, you know, in general, you know, reserve currencies don't fail. Right? I mean, this is the U.S. dollar we're talking about. It's the world's reserve currency. I say that in general. But there's a first for everything. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's to my way of seeing it, it's not out of the realm of possibility. You know, it definitely falls into the, it could happen camp. And, and if it does happen, you know, you're going to be really glad that you, if you had savings, and st by the way, stocks will go up a lot too, because mm -hmm. on the other side, the stocks will be pricing whatever the new currency is. The one, the loser, the, the, the sucker at the table, as Luke Grumman likes to say, is the bond market, right? I mean, the, the you know, the bond market is just going to get wiped out, it's just but, totally wiped out. I mean, and, and, this is, and this is why, this is why. You know, that's what Sailor is doing. Sailor is doing the Hugo Stennis trade, right? Which is to say, you know, he's he's borrowing, you know, he's, he's borrowing and he's using, you know, in dollars. So he owes people back dollars and he's using those dollars to buy Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin will go up in price and the dollars will go down in value. He'll pay it back in worthless dollars at some point in the future. And I mean, this is how, in my opinion, he'll end up being the richest man in the world, you know, in, in five or ten years. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I know we got to run here in a minute. Um, yep. th just that to me is the bond thing. You just touched on something again, and we can, we can touch on this more in the future, but the bond thing to me in general, government, like federal bonds, not maybe sure. municipal, maybe, but the government bond market to me just seems immoral. Uh, I, you're, you're, you're guaranteeing yourself slavery into the future. I don't understand that at all. And I, I like, you can't convince me otherwise. I think you're guaranteeing you and your kids are in slavery in the future to pay taxes to the government. I, that's beyond me. It's be, yeah. and I wanted to get your takeaway from Madeira also, by the way, before we run to what yeah. your thought was, what you, what yeah, your big takeaway from Madeira. So those two things. <laughs> yeah. So, well, you're right about the government bond market and you know, they've, they've got a lot of people that, you know, are kind of brainwashed and you know, a lot of large organizations have to buy bonds. The banks have to buy bonds and who knows for all we know, the federal reserve is covertly buying bonds. I mean, you know, they will do anything <laughs> they can to keep the system alive. We know that we've discussed that. Um, my takeaway from Madeira was it was fabulous. It was just a, a great conference, one of the best. Um, it was pure Bitcoin, you know, no, I mean, the, the Bitcoin conference in uh, Nashville, you know, it used to be in Miami. Yeah. I always have trouble with that because it's, you know, it's in order to make money, they, they let a lot of the shit coiners yeah, never come in. And yeah. It was, I mean, to me, Bitcoin and the shit coins are two different things. They shouldn't be in the same conference. Um, so it was pure Bitcoin. There were some great attendees. It was really, it was just an incredible vibe. And, uh, you know, I don't see how, um, I mean, if, I think it's worth taking the time. There's certain speeches you really could listen to. If you Google Bitcoin on YouTube, Bitcoin Atlantis, um, the first day the sailor speech at two in the afternoon was good. Uh, there's a panel that I did that was at five. It's the eight hour mark on the video. Um, you know, Jeff, yep. Jeff Booth's speeches on uh, his speech on Saturday was incredibly good. Um, yes. You know, there were others with Lynn Alden and so forth. So. Yeah, it, it was a it was a great conference, and um, you know I I think that um, you know it, it's if you're into Bitcoin and you can afford to go to these conferences, I mean they're really they're very human scale, and you can really you can meet all these people. I mean you know it's yep. you know, I, I saw a sailor at one of the parties. He's just talking to plebs, you know yep. what I mean? And, he, and then they I mean it's like for hours, you know what yes. I mean? I mean it's just I mean. There's no, there's no ego. The, 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 you know, all Bitcoiners treat other Bitcoiners with humbleness and respect. And so, 
it's it's really it's a fun experience. I mean, the other one I would speak very highly of is the Pacific Bitcoin out in uh, Santa Monica. I think it's in October. Um, that's yeah. thrown by Swan and, and Corey. Um, same thing, you know, pure Bitcoin signal. Great people that are there. Um, very much worth taking the time to to go to. And there are a lot of other good ones too. I mean, I'm going to be going to the having party in El Salvador in about a month, which should be fun. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Bitcoin Canada in late May. And I might be going, I'm not 100% sure, but I might be going to BTC Prague in June. So, yeah. um, but, and that's it. I mean, I, there are 10 other ones that, you know, I'd like to go yeah. to. You, you can't do them all. There's Bitblock yeah. Boom, there's Unconfiscated, and there, there are a gazillion. My partner's at one right now out in Jackson Hole. Um, yes. It's a, you know, kind of a big thing for you know, yeah. related to the mining business. But, you know, you can't do everything, right? And, uh, but they're good. They're good for networking. They're good for getting information. Um, and, you know, they're, they're good because they give you a sense of um, what this community is about, who the people are. And it's, it's really, it's a great bunch of people. They really are great people. So it really is. And a community is the number one thing in a survival situation, Absolutely. right? Having a community around you. So that's, Absolutely. that's yeah, where it's no, at. It's, it's, it's wealth. So yeah. it is. Appreciate you, Larry. Thank you so much. Where can, where can everyone oh, find you? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter under my name, Lawrence Lepard. I make a lot of noise. I hate the central banks. <laughs> yeah, you do. Right. <laughs> You know that, but they, they've caused a lot of pain. I think they deserve to be hated. So I, I don't feel, I don't apologize for it. You're one, um, of, you're one of the best followers by far. Cause I, oh, I, I know what guaranteed that. every day I get a, I get an I, actual I make a lot of noise. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, EMA2, uh, Edward Mark L for the letters. EMA2.com is my website. It talks about the funds we manage. Um, there's a, uh, we do a quarterly macro letter that's free. Uh, you can sign up for it. We will never spam you. Um, and, and that's, I think some people find that interesting if they want to every quarter get an update on how we see the world and how we see this sound money thesis unfolding, you can find it there. There's a lot of gold stuff there too. As you know, I came from the gold world, still in the gold world, but transitioning away from it as time goes by. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think, and you know, I don't, in nominal terms, gold will never go down and, and gold is going to, it's going to protect you very well in this particular crash that I see coming. Um, but having said that, I, I think Bitcoin is actually better protection. So I, of the two, I, I mean, Bitcoin really is the fastest horse. And so I, you know, I, I tend to recommend that, you know, I mean, if, if you can't stand the volatility, then gold is a great sound money choice. Um, I recommend that everybody have some Bitcoin and, and you know, you, you weight it such that you can stand the volatility. I mean, I think the worst thing that can happen in Bitcoin, I, I, I've seen it happen to people price chase it. They buy it at the top. I know some people bought it at 68 the last time around. You know, and then it went to 15 and they felt like shit and some of them sold it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yeah. those of us who were in it know that that was the wrong move. But, yep. but if you don't really understand what you're buying and why you're buying it, that can happen to you. So, you know, I think any, any time you buy Bitcoin, you have to mentally steal yourself and realize, you know, in terms of what percentage of your net worth it is, this could go down 50% and I don't care, you know, this, this could, because, because in five years it'll be much higher. So, but it could, in the interim, it could go down 50% and that, you know, you gotta be prepared for that. And so as we orange pill people, I think it's important to point that out. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you. So, thank you, Larry. Thank you so much yeah, for your thank time. You. It's always fun. Um, I hope we'll see you soon at one of these shows. In fact, I think yes. Canada, right? Possibly. Yeah, yeah probably yeah, in a month or two in Canada. Yes. Okay. So looking forward yeah, to it. Sounds great. Keep, keep doing the work. We'll yeah. keep, keep doing the work. I love it. Keep, Same, brother. Keep doing the pods, Same. all of it. Anytime you want me back, I'm happy to do it. Love it. Let's do it.